Welcome to Built to Go, a van life podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Wagg, coming to you from the College of Curiosity. This time it's episode 221, and we're going to take a break from the normal podcast theme and just talk about some listener letters I've been receiving. I'm going to read you the letter and my response and thank everyone for sending me such nice stuff. We're also going to talk about some news, including a temporary toll tag that could be a good solution for our toll woes. And we'll talk about interior cabin filters and Land Rover driving school. Quite the cat's breakfast here. Cat's breakfast? Dog's breakfast? Rag and bone buffet? Whatever term you would like. If you don't like any of them, just make up your own. That's what I do. Anyway, thank you very much for joining me here once again for episode 221. And I have been very negative lately. <laughs> the last few podcasts have not been the most positive things in the world, and it's time to be a little bit more positive. And a very positive thing that's happened for me lately is, for some reason, there's a lot more people listening to the show. I don't know why. I'm not upset about it, but looking at the charts, which I don't really care that much about, I had a whole bunch of green arrows, and that means that they're going up in the charts. Uh, the show is actually ranking in travel podcasts in the U.S., and, well, heck... If there's more of you there, welcome! I'm very glad to have you here. And I thought I would take some time to read some listener letters that have been sent to me and my responses to them as a thank you to the people writing the letters. I always love receiving email. I'm saying letters. I'm old. I mean email, of course. And uh, I like responding to them, too. So I thought I would just share with you some of this correspondence and maybe encourage you to correspond. And one of my favorite types of email to receive is a correction. I like being corrected. I know people don't like that. They get defensive. And, you know, I do too. I, I am a human being after all, allegedly. But when I get a correction that is a solid, decent, well-verified correction that increases my knowledge, it makes me very happy because I know more afterwards than I did before. And I really have to thank Andy from Finland, who sent me this great letter. And I'm just going to read you the letter, okay? So, Andy, thank you very much. The letter goes, Greetings from Finland! <laughs> A great start, I have to say. Always enjoy listening to your podcast. I have a van which is mostly used for cargo needs, but I throw in a cotton cooler and camp in it quite often. I really like the tips and ideas I get from you, so thanks. Andy, you are more than welcome, and that is such a great way to get into van life. It does not have to be an elaborate build. You need a vehicle and a place to sleep, and you are good to go. Okay, back to the email. Although I now live in Finland, I grew up in the U.S. and spent several years in the U.S. Navy as an electronic warfare specialist on fast attack submarines. I've been to Arco and know exactly the submarine sale you are talking about. So last week I talked about this piece of a submarine in Arco, Idaho, and that's what he's referring to. A couple of points I just have to mention. It's the sale of a nuclear-powered fast-attack submarine, not a ballistic missile sub. Not a huge difference in the story you told, but a huge difference to people like me. He is right. I said it was the, I think I actually used the word conning tower of a ballistic submarine. It is more appropriately called a sail, which may or may not have a conning tower in it. I actually got a little too deep into all that stuff. But it is a sail, and it was actually from a fast attack submarine. And then, here's the most important part. Another thing. It's not the USS Devilfish, but the USS Hawkbill. I know this because I was crew on the USS Hawkbill SSN-666 for a couple years. This guy was actually stationed on this submarine. And so, well, I'll let him tell the story. There was always a story completely false, but told so widely that it became common knowledge in some circles that the names and numbers of ships are drawn from a list. And it just so happened that the 666 and Devilfish came up at the same time. But someone in Congress overruled and said to take the next name from the list. And this is completely untrue, but persists. And the real USS Devilfish, SS-292, is completely overlooked and morphed into the Hawkbill story. So... There is a USS Devilfish. This is just not it. And I did a little bit of research on this and found out that people in Arco will often refer to it as the Devilfish, but they 
are just giving it that name based on the 666 on the sail that is not the name of the submarine that the sail came from so i apologize profusely for getting all that wrong that's simply laziness on my part i absolutely could have looked all that up but i just thought i remembered from being there and i didn't do my proper research and i apologize for that Andy goes on to say, When I visited ARCO a few years ago, I spent some time talking with the people working at the exhibit, and they were so happy to have questions answered by an ex-crew member. I got a free lunch while we spoke. <laughs> anyway, thanks again for the great podcast, Andy. Andy, thanks so much for that letter. I absolutely appreciate it. And I do encourage people to go to ARCO. It is a great little unusual town. And heck, if you're going to Craters of the Moon anyway, you might as well just head to ARCO. You know what? You're going to, I don't have to tell you, you're going to go there because it's like the only place to get beer. I also got a lovely letter from Chase, and this is this is an interesting one, so I'm going to not comment, I'm just going to read this in its entirety, because this is a challenging email, actually. So, Chase lives in Omaha, Nebraska, and so I'll read the email. Jeff, you may have answered this on your podcast already, but I was wondering about time. I love making road trips, but I just don't have very much vacation. I, too, live in the Midwest, Omaha, Nebraska, to be exact. So I guess my question is... How many days do you normally take off for a road trip? Come January, I finally get four weeks of vacation, so I'll have more opportunities to hit the road. I already am lucky enough to have Friday, Saturday, and Sundays off of work. Do you think if I use just one day of vacation and make it a four-day weekend, that is enough time to travel somewhere cool and back? Appreciate your input. Thank you, Chase. And this is my response to Chase. Hello! I find living in the Midwest a bit challenging in this regard because things are so spread out that there's a lot of driving time needed to get to any place that looks different from where you already are. The good news for you and me is that I-80 connects to everything. It's just a matter of time. I vary a lot, but for me, I try to limit my driving to 10 hours a day, with a max of two days in a row at that pace. Like I said, that varies a lot, but if you have two days to drive, 20 hours from Omaha gets you to an awful lot of interesting places, including Canada. For a four-day weekend, you're within striking distance of Kansas City, Denver, Chicago, I typically stop in Aurora, Nebraska when I travel west from Chicago, and a number of -of out-of-the-way places. The question is, what would you like to do? There's a good amount of free camping in the area, and I mean nice spots, not just Cracker Barrel. See what iOverlander offers. And for me, I'm always looking for odd places to visit, so I'd check Roadside America or Atlas Obscura and find an anchor. So I might say, I want to see the Stone Jail in Aurora, Kansas, and make that my main mission. I'd fill the rest of the trip with side missions, or just relaxing somewhere nice, depending. If you want to do a safe test... Plan a weekend in Aurora, Nebraska. There's an awesome free campground at Streeter Park with full hookups, flush toilets, and dump station. In town, there are two great museums and a fabulous used bookstore and a mysterious flashing light in the courthouse that I'll leave to you to learn about. It's an easy ride from Omaha, and if you don't enjoy it, you can just head home without having spent too much money. Anyway, get out there, and thanks very much for listening. So, I thought... That was an excellent question from Chase because you know, time is a resource and some of us have money in no time. In fact, the truth is that a lot of people who have a lot of money are working very hard to make that money and they simply don't have the time to do this. And so that's an important thing to consider and I appreciate the question for it. So Chase, thank you very much. I'm very excited about this. I received an email from Michael. Michael was just being a super nice guy and sent this along and I really appreciate this. Hi, Jeff. Recent convert to full-time van life and burning through your podcast as fast as I can. I think I'm up to episode 120-ish. Ooh, it gets weird from there, but thank you, Michael. I recently installed three new 65-watt USB-C PD plugs. That's power delivery. That's what PD stands for. This allows me to charge MacBook Pro and pretty much all my devices with USB. But a happy side effect is also being able to use USB with the conversion kit below to run my T-Mobile router, CPAP, etc. Pretty much anything with a power brick that can run off 12 volts that requires some funky plug. Anyhow, I heard you cover multiple facets of USB and also the beauty of keeping things 12 volts and minimizing the need for inverters. Is there any issues using these converter kits? Any way to damage devices on 12 volt versus 120 volts? Thanks again for the great info, random knowledge, and trivia. 
and fantastic, unbiased, and non-political presentations of the topics. Michael. Thank you, Michael. Michael, I cannot tell you how excited I am. Well, actually did, because I replied to your email, but in the email I sent you, I expressed how excited I am that you found this product. So, backing up a step here, folks. USB, as we know, has been a pain in the butt. I mean, it, it's changed the world. I mean, we can charge things with USB now, which is something you couldn't do 15 years ago. It, it's a novel concept to old people like me that you can charge things from a computer. That seems bizarre, but it's here, it's mainstream, but it's branching out and being a little bit of a problem. Everything's going to USB-C now, so it's easy to recommend that if you buy a device that charges, make sure it uses USB-C. But there's still a big gap in laptops. So USB-C can be used to charge all new Mac laptops, provided that they give enough power. And that's where the PD comes in. Not all USB ports give out the same amount of power. Some give out half an amp, some give out one amp, some give out 2.1, some give out 2.4, some give out three. It's all over the place and it's kind of a nightmare. So if you are installing USB outlets in your van, make sure you get PD outlets. That stands for power delivery and it's a whole completely different protocol for power over USB that also changes the voltage as well as the amperage, which is confusing. The good news is everything is backwards compatible. So if you get a USB PD port, you can plug in any of your old USB devices in there and they should be fine. But, and this is the point of his email, there is a big gap with PC laptops because most of them still have this massive brick you have to carry around. And I know that's the case with mine. I have a fairly inexpensive Acer gaming laptop that has this massive brick that I have to carry around as well as the laptop. And it's annoying, especially for someone being used to Macs, where I literally just grab my Mac and a USB cable and hit the road. With this thing, with this PC, I need to have this giant brick. What this kit does that he's talking about is it eliminates the need for the brick because it adapts the USB-C to the barrel connector that your laptop uses. So you can plug any laptop into any PD, at least 65 watts, power port. I know. If you're not technically savvy about USB, everything I said is very confusing. So let me just say this. This kit that he just talked about will make your life easier if you have a PC. It will let you charge your PC over USB ports if you have a fancy high power USB port. That's the bottom line. I was so excited by this email that I actually went out and bought one. <laughs> it hasn't come yet. So when it comes, I'm going to install it and let you know how it works to charge my Acer laptop. And I am expecting very good things. It's only 25 bucks. It's not that big of a risk. I'm expecting it to work very well because I can see what it's doing. And I think I understand it. And I think this is going to be a great solution for folks living in vans. I mean, you could just get rid of all your bricks. It could power your TV. It could power anything that is 19 volts or less. And most PC laptops are at 19 volts. Anyway, I wrote back to Michael and thanked him. In fact, I was so excited I had to write him twice because I thanked him and I forgot to answer his questions. <laughs> so I answered his questions. And, and uh, the question, basically the answer to his question is no, I don't think there's any chance this is going to harm anything. DC is, is simpler and more forgiving than AC. It doesn't have, you don't have to worry about waves or anything like that. If there aren't any waves, it doesn't change. And I think this is going to work just fine. But I, I will test it myself. We'll find out. And ironically, he sent me another email. As I was replying to him, he was in the van listening to my podcast talking about USB ports. He was listening to episode 132 where I talked about USB ports. And anyway, it's all kind of surreal, you know. People talking on podcasts seem like they're not actually real, but, you know, I am actually real. I do exist in the world, and heck, there's a chance we will bump into each other at some point, and that's what happened here. So, Michael, thank you so much for that. I will have the full review once I get the thing, but I am super encouraged by this product, and uh, I, I really think this is going to make people's lives a lot easier. Plus, separate, completely separate thing that didn't come up. You can use this to, to charge power stations at a higher rate, maybe, than just using the cigarette lighter plug. This may be a superior way to charge power stations. I haven't verified that yet. I'm going to have to play with it. 
but it will at least be another way to charge power stations. So anyway, obviously I'm too excited about this. I'll stop talking about it, but uh, yeah, Michael, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks very much to Howard for buying me a couple gallons of diesel at buymeacoffee.com slash built to go. Howard, I really appreciate the support, and I especially appreciate the support of all of those folks who donate every month. Thank you so much. Because of Howard and folks that donate every month, there are no ads on this podcast, and we will have no ads. And I think that makes everybody happy. I know it makes me happy. So if you'd like to support the show, visit buymeacoffee.com slash built to go. That's two T's, not three, not one. And we will continue to have a lot more content and a lot fewer ads. Van Life News. A little bit of a slow week for news, but I found some interesting things that, I don't know if they're news, but peck they're interesting, so I'm going to throw them at you. One is that a hackster.io, not a website we typically associate with van life too much, they're reviewing this project that this gentleman has. It is an open source van control system. So using a Raspberry Pi in a box, he has this software that will let you control like everything in your van. Like it will monitor the batteries and the solar panel. It'll tell you what the status of your battery is and allow you to change how it charges like maybe you have multiple sources that you can charge from like the alternator and solar panels that'll let you switch between those it will tell you about your lights and it's all controllable by a mobile app now these things have existed for a while in the high-end winnebago's and airstreams and things like that you can get these systems they've never been great they've always been problematic but this one is free it's free it's open source. I mean, you have to build the device yourself, so it's going to require some technical knowledge, but the software is free, and it, again, is open source. If you're a programmer type, you can modify this and submit your changes to the project. I think this is a very interesting idea. The box itself is 3D printable. There's complete instructions on what you put in there and how to wire it. It doesn't look that complicated to me. And if you are somebody who's looking to make a smart van, this might be a pretty cool thing to look at. So that's it. Hackster, H-A-C-K-S-T-E-R dot I-O. And I will have a link in the show notes. Also, Gear Junkie, which is a lot more associated with van life than, than Hackster, they have a rundown of the best 4x4 vans that just came out. And if you're looking for a 4x4 van, this is worth looking at. And I, I, I recommend you take a meta approach to it. I mean, read their recommendations, but don't take them at face value. Take a, a, a 20,000 foot view and look at what they're saying. And if you look at the 10 vans... They're basically saying you either have to spend a lot of money on a custom-built van on one of the existing platforms, or you have to get something weird and old to get a true 4x4 vehicle. For example, they recommend a Ford Econo line from Field Van Ford Classic 4x4. They install an actual real 4x4 system, not what you get with a brand new Sprinter, not what you get with a brand new Transit. Those are not true 4x4 off-roading systems. This is, and that's a good thing to know if you're really looking to do some 4x4 off-roading stuff. If you just want all-wheel drive for weather, like you're worried about snow on a paved road, you're not going to need the full-time four-wheel drive. But if you're going to go rock crawling in your van, which mm, <laughs> I really want you to think carefully about that, this would be the way to go. They also have one for minivans, and they're doing conversions on the all-wheel drive Toyota Siennas that they recommend too. But then they kind of run out of vans, you know? Um, they recommend the Revel if you have unlimited resources. That's not going to be too big of a surprise. But then they go into this strange direction where they recommend, for example, the Volkswagen Vanagon Synchro, which hasn't been sold in the U.S. since, like, 1990 or something like that so they recommend that so you know you'd have to find one and it would be tricky to get parts for i would think but maybe not they're still very popular or they recommend a jdm vehicle the mitsubishi delica space gear l400 jdm being a japan domestic market these are right hand drive vehicles that are over 25 years old that are allowed to be imported into the u.s although some states like new hampshire refuse to register them so this is a tricky problem proposition if you want to try it then they also recommend the 4x4 toyota hi ace one of the legendary vans of the world that we can't get in the u.s because of the chicken tax but again that 25 year rule applies there so anyway it's an interesting article on 
options for 4x4 vans and it kind of highlights the fact that we just don't have that many vans we can choose from in the US. We used to have a lot more options and to prove that, <laughs> the last one they recommend is the 4x4 Chevy Astro van, a still sought after van, arguably the perfect combination of size and power and price and we just can't have them because nobody makes them anymore. And finally, some news about toll tags. We talked an awful lot about that last week. In Florida, it has become common that if you fly to Florida and rent a car, the rental agency will try to sign you up for a toll tag. Like I said, Florida has more tolls than any other state in the country, so this is a real issue, especially if you're in Orlando. There's tolls everywhere. So the, the rental car company will say, hey, we'll take care of your tolls, sign here, whatever. But they charge extra fees for it, and it's really annoying. And the state of Florida is annoyed at this, too, because they're not getting those fees. The fees are going to some third-party processor. So the state of Florida, according to the New York Times, anyway, has a new thing where you can buy a temporary toll pass and just get it out of a vending machine, and it'll hang off the mirror of the car, and then you can just drive around and pay the actual toll rate, the same rate that people who live in Florida pay, and then you just throw the thing away when you're done. It costs 10 bucks, meaning you have to put at least $10 worth of value into it. But where the average day's drive from Disney to one of the hotels could cost you six fifty in tolls anyway, you'll go through that 10 bucks pretty quick. So this is a an improvement to the toll situation. Not necessarily the money part of it. I mean, there's too many tolls and they cost too much. But to the convenience of it and the not having to get gouged again to pay extra fees just to pay the toll. So that's in the New York Times. I'll have a link to that in the show notes. Tech Talk. Did you know that your van or SUV or whatever vehicle you're using has two air filters? At least it might. There is the air filter under the hood that you really should be aware of. I hope you are. That needs to be changed fairly regularly, like normally with every oil change or something like that. But there's a, usually in modern vehicles now, there's another one inside the cabin. And this is a very easy filter to forget. You can't see it. There's no warning lights. An oil change typically won't involve replacing this. But it can actually be important, especially if you're driving in dusty conditions a lot. Now, do you have one or not? That you're going to have to figure out for yourself because I don't know what kind of a vehicle you have. So what I recommend you do is go onto YouTube, type in the year, make, and model of your vehicle, and then cabin air filter, and see what pops up. My NV200 didn't have one because I had a 2014 NV200. It turns out that, like, I think in 2015 they added them. So it can be a little tricky to figure out. Why do you want to replace this thing? Why does it matter? I mean, it is a filter that filters the air that comes into the air conditioning and heating system when you, it keeps dust out of the cabin. That's basically what it's for. It'll trap dust and pollen, and some of them have carbon in them that's supposed to help reduce road odors and things like that, but that's their basic purpose. The problem is, is that when they get clogged, they put extra strain on your blower motor and those go bad. And sometimes it's a real pain to replace those motors. So you don't want that to go bad. The other thing is that if that filter gets clogged up, your vehicle might fog up a lot more if you're driving in the rain, for example. You might find that even with the air conditioner on and the dial set to fresh rather than recirculate, it's still difficult to keep your window clear. That is a, a sign that your interior cabin air filter needs to be replaced. Now, most of the videos I've seen for replacing these filters, it, it's a pain in the butt. I don't know of any vehicles where they make this easy. You usually have to remove the glove box in most of these because that's where all this ventilation stuff is. And in my 2019 Ram 1500 Classic, that's exactly how it works. You have to remove the glove box and then there's a little tiny compartment that you open and then you have to fiddle to get the filter out and then you put the new one in it costs like 11 bucks for the filter that's not the problem it's just kind of a pain in the butt so the first vehicle i ever had that had one of these was a 1999 subaru forester what you have i don't know but it's something to think about if you're having problems with condensation in your vehicle or you hear your motor working extra hard go ahead and check to see if you have one and then go ahead and replace it oh and uh yeah 
you can just remove it if you want. It's not gonna hurt anything, you just might get more dust in your vehicle. Product review. It's a little unusual product review. I had a friend who's going to Alaska who asked my recommendation on binoculars. And uh, I gave it to him. And I'm going to give it to you. And if, first off, if you're going to Alaska on a cruise ship, yeah, bring binoculars. Because my wife and I have been there a few times. And we spend an awful lot of time on the balcony of the cruise ship just watching like sea otters and whales and eagles and all that stuff. It's, it's kind of amazing. It's one of the best parts of the trip. But having the right binoculars is a big deal. And people who aren't birders or astronomers or whatever don't typically understand how binoculars work. So I'm going to give you a little primer in binoculars. Binoculars have two numbers on them. There's a, an A and then an X and then a B number. So it might be 8 by 42 or 10 by 50 or something like that. The first number is the magnification. That's how magnified it is. Bigger means more magnification. So 8 by 42 is 8 times magnification. 10 by 42 is 10 times magnification. You get it. More magnification is not necessarily better because the higher the magnification is, the more difficult it is to find what the heck you're looking for. <laughs> and that's where the second number comes in. The second number is basically field of view. It's how much stuff you can see. It's how many degrees you can see out the binoculars. So an eight by 42 is eight times magnification and a 42 degree field of view. An 8x50 is 8 times magnification and a 50 degree field of view, and you get it. You can go on from there, and all these numbers go up and up and up. But again, bigger is not always better. If you're doing astral observations, you might want a whole lot of magnification and maybe a big field of view too, but you're going to use a tripod with that because it's going to be so unsteady handheld that it's not going to make any sense. For the purposes of van life, where we're going to be using binoculars to look at birds and wildlife and signs maybe, or, you know, just trying to figure out where we are. <laughs> Not that I've ever done that. I really like this particular pair of binoculars. It's 8x42, which I find to be the sweet spot because it's they're small, but they're not too small. Uh, when the field of view number goes up, so do the binoculars. So 42, I find to be the sweet spot. And they just feel good. I wear glasses. These things work with glasses. They're waterproof and they're tough. And they're sadly very expensive. But I'm going to recommend them anyway. If you are serious about having decent binoculars, kind of like the last binoculars you will ever buy, then I encourage you to look at the Minolta Monarch. Minolta Monarch 8x42. They make a 10x42 as well. That would be okay, but I like the 8x42s. The M5 8x42 specifically. Now, they're $286. Yes, they are not inexpensive. And you can certainly find binoculars that are cheaper that will work just fine. But for me... I have never had a more comfortable pair of binoculars, and I've owned a lot of binoculars, including some of those really big ones. These fit very easily in a suitcase or a backpack. They can attach to your belt, or you can just use the strap. Very quick to open up and look at, and very, very easy to focus, which I find to be their biggest benefit. They do not offer any zoom, so forget about that. They don't take pictures. They're not super fancy like that. They're just good, solid, reliable binoculars. So I will have a link in the show notes. Officially, it is the 1676 model, but it is also called the Monarch M5 8x42 binocular. I really like these, and I think you will too. And as a bonus, you can get renewed ones that is you know refurbished or whatever for 220 dollars i don't know what exactly they're refurbishing on them i assume they would be fine but 220 bucks for these binoculars i think is actually a bargain so i'll have a link to that as well tales from the road so i used to be a land rover guy i loved land rovers this is back in the 2000s and I actually owned two. I had a 2000 Land Rover Discovery 2 SE, and then I sold it and bought a Ford F-150 fancy 4x4 truck, and then ended up going back to a Land Rover. So I had a, a 2004 Land Rover Discovery 2 SE, which was the last year they made that particular model. 
And I loved it. I loved having a Land Rover. I wouldn't have one now. <laughs> I, not only has Land Rover changed completely as a company, I wouldn't have the Land Rovers I had back then now because my 2004 Land Rover got 11 miles a gallon on premium fuel. You had to use premium fuel. And uh, yeah, that's just not sustainable. <laughs> that is not going to cut it these days. But while I had it, I had a great time. I had uh, studded Haka Politas on it. It was the ultimate snow beast vehicle. Nothing stopped that thing. But I realized that it has a lot of knobs and buttons and stuff and buttons I've never seen on any other vehicle. And I thought, you know, it would be nice to learn how to drive this thing properly. So I actually went to Land Rover Driving School. And I went to it at the Greenbrier Resort in White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia. This is a famous, really expensive hotel resort complex with a golf course and bowling alley and movie theater. I mean, they've got everything there. But they also have the bunkers for the Senate. That if stuff goes bad, the Senate is supposed to leave Washington, D.C. and then come to this hotel and like hide in the basement. I think it is no longer used for that purpose, but the bunkers are still there and you can tour them. Anyway, that's not why I was there. I was there to drive my Land Rover over Hill and Dale, and they certainly do have Hill and Dale, and they have a professional driver join you. And you don't do it in your vehicle, but you do do it in a vehicle that's the same type as yours. So they had my same Land Rover there, uh, but it was a little modified. So it's funny. Land Rovers in the U.S. are seen as luxury vehicles, but in the rest of the world, they're more like just vehicles, at least at that time. And the Land Rover Discovery series was just kind of a pedestrian 4x4 vehicle. It wasn't anything fancy. And to bring it to the U.S. and to make it fancy, they added all kinds of crap to it. And you could see just by looking that they added a door panel that would hold a speaker because the originals didn't have speakers in the doors. They added on special things for cup holders because the original didn't have cup holders. And the worst thing they did was they added ground effects. They added this big thing below the bumper with fog lights and if you've ever done any off-roading, you know that you don't want things to hang down behind the bumper. So what they did at the Land Rover Driving School was they took a sawzall and cut all that off. <laughs> Their off-road training vehicles had all that stuff literally just hacked off. So they were basically saying, look, if you want to do serious off-roading in this vehicle, you can, but you got to lose some of the fancy stuff. So I never cut mine off, but I, I understood exactly where they were coming from. And so you go out with this driver and you hit the road. And honestly, I knew the vehicle was capable, but we did stuff that I was absolutely sure the vehicle wasn't going to be able to do. We went up hills so steep, I thought we were going to roll over backwards. And we, we drove up streams, you know, in the water. I mean, it was exactly the kind of stuff you want to do when you have a Land Rover. I had a great time. And then there was this one moment when I thought, this guy's crazy. There is no way we're going to survive this. He had us creep up the top of a hill, and we're right on the top, and I could not see past the front of the hood. There was nothing but sky. Apparently, there was road beneath us, and that if we kept going forward, we would crest this hill, and it would be fine. But I couldn't see it. It was like a 45-degree angle. And he said, trust the vehicle, but don't touch the brakes. Now, I understand about engine braking and putting it in low gear and stuff. That is not what he was talking about. This Land Rover had a special button that I'd never seen on any other vehicle before. It's, it's more common now. It's called hill descent control. And you press this button and you point and hold onto the steering wheel and let go of everything else. And so, trusting this guy knew what he was talking about, I did exactly that. I held onto the steering wheel, somewhat white-knuckled, and crested the hill, and then strongly resisted the urge to touch the brake or gas. And the Land Rover made the most horrific noises, grinding and stuttering and just whining and creaking. It was making all these weird noises. And as we very slowly and in a very controlled fashion went down this incredibly steep hill covered with dust and loose rocks, he explained that what the vehicle was doing was using its anti-lock brakes to control the speed of each individual wheel. 
And basically, if the wheel started going too fast, it would apply brakes to that wheel and let the other wheels take over. And it was doing that many times a second it was making those measurements. And that's what accounted for all the bizarre noises and stuff. And the thing just gently went down the hill. I mean, it was amazing. And I thought, holy cow, this is the best off-road vehicle ever. And then as I'm like at the height of elation of like, wow, I can go anywhere and do anything, the guy said, look, it's easy to go downhill. <laughs> Any vehicle is going to be able to go downhill. So, so don't get cocky. <laughs> and he's right. You know, going downhill is one of the easier things you can do in the vehicle. You know, you have gravity working for you. Going downhill in a controlled fashion, well, this button just made it a lot easier. And, and heck, that was a lot of fun. Sadly, I am no longer a Land Rover person. I don't recommend Land Rovers in any way, shape, or form. The company has completely changed. All the Land Rover driving schools around the country are closed, at least the ones I knew of. And it's a completely different proposition now. I don't even recommend you buy an old Land Rover unless you're going to buy something like a Defender, you know, a true Land Rover, and you are very handy with a wrench. But I did enjoy my time owning a Land Rover. I had a lot of fun in it. And that driving school was just one example of that. A place to visit. I am a little angry at myself because I was recently in Ticonderoga, New York, as I was driving back from Vermont, and I did not stop at this place, and I've been promising myself that I would stop here for years. And for it just, it just didn't occur to me, and I'm like, ah! So I'm warning you, if you go anywhere near Ticonderoga, New York, even if you get as close as Albany, you should make a side trek to go visit the Star Trek tour in Ticonderoga, New York. This crazy guy rebuilt most of the sets from the original Star Trek, TOS as we call it, and they look identical, exactly the same as what you see on the TV show. Yes, you can sit in the captain's chair. Yes, you can go to sick bay and hear the dong, 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 and all the weird little bouncing lights and arrows and hypo sprays and all that. It's all there. And they let you crawl around on it and take pictures. And anyway, if you want to pretend that you are in Star Trek, <laughs> Get your Star Trek uniform, and I recommend the red shirt personally. Head to Ticonderoga, New York, and check this place out. It, it's just amazing how detailed it is. And sometimes they have events like November 15th through 17th. William Shatner is actually going to be there on the bridge of the Enterprise. I, I mean, it sounds, you know, all right. I know those of you who aren't Trek fans are like, why is he so excited about this? Well, because... You know, this is the stuff I grew up with as a kid, and I've always wanted my favorite sci-fi shows to be real. And, well, <laughs> this is as real as it's going to get. Now, it is not terribly inexpensive, but I, I, I would pay a lot for this, to be honest. But for 50 bucks, you can get it and have a tour. And, of course, it's going to be more when you are dealing with William Shatner or some other celebrity being there. But if you don't want photos, and of course they're going to control the photos, if you don't want photos, you can get in for just 23 bucks, And you can just wander around the USS Enterprise 1701 and just imagine what it would be like if something like this actually existed. I'm so mad at myself for not going. I've had friends who've gone. Fisher, my son Fisher has gone. And they have these amazing pictures and oh i don't know anyway so you go <laughs> i have a link in the show notes but it's an easy url it's star trek tour.com boldly go where many people have gone before resource recommendation so now that we are dealing with led lights which we all are at this point if you still have incandescent lights in your van swap them out get rid of them any light bulb that gets super hot is old obsolete it's wasting power you don't want it change it for led but which led not all leds are created the same now we have a thing called color temperature we have to worry about incandescent bulbs also have color temperature but traditionally they would give off a wider spectrum of colors so people didn't really pay that much attention to it unless they were painters or photographers or something like that leds don't have that wide spectrum they're basically giving off 
one spectrum of light and it can be super warm meaning kind of orange approaching red or it can be super cold meaning bright white approaching blue which one do you want for the inside of your van well, it turns out it's a matter of choice. You can buy some of these lights that you can actually swap from one to the other. You can control the color. Or if you're going to buy standalone light bulbs, spend a bit of time and see which color you like. You know, and, and what I recommend is that you have a mix. You have some warm and some cold. Warm light is typically more comforting. It's the kind of light you'd want at the end of the day when you're winding down watching TV. You know, you want a light that's a little bit more yellow or golden or something like that but when you're cleaning or you're working on something that's very intricate you want a whiter light you want something that it seems brighter even though it's actually the same amount of light it feels brighter it increases the contrast of the things you're looking at so make sure you understand what you're getting when you buy an led light and they're measured in kelvins which is not the most friendly unit so here's a source that will help you out it is lightingdesignstudio.co.uk slash color hyphen temperature, and they spell color with that extraneous U, as they really like to do. I will have a link in the show notes, of course. And this one page explains the different colors and shows examples of them and will really help you understand why there are different colors and what the numbers mean. Basically, the higher the number, the, the more Kelvins, the whiter, actually bluer the light is going to be. A normal white light is 5,000 to 6,000. Golden light is more 2,000 to 1,000. And a whitish blue light is, is 9,000 to 10,000 K. That's the basic range. But it they have this one picture that has 10 of these lights at all different temperatures, all shining at the same time on a wall. And it really helps you understand. So if you're confused about color temperature or you just want to know exactly what you're getting when you buy that 4,500 Kelvin light, Check out this one page. It will explain it all. And yeah, I'm sorry. You're going to have to ignore the extra use. I don't know why they think they can waste use like that. So folks, thank you very much for joining me for episode 221. I absolutely appreciate you tuning in every week. Music, as always, is by Simon Wagg. And uh, just a programming note, I may have jury duty next week, and that may interfere with my schedule, because I don't know if it's going to take a half an hour or six months. <laughs> so we will see. I will let you know as I know. But until then, remember the words of Eleanor Roosevelt, who said, The purpose of life is to live it, to taste experience to the utmost, to reach out eagerly and without fear for newer and richer experience.